Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yeah, that's great. David, thank you so much. Kathy, thank you so much. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here at Trent today. And uh, just as David mentioned, I visited Trent. Uh, my connection to your beautiful campus is coming here just over 20 years ago uh, to a campus I didn't realize was not this one, but uh, a different campus. And um, uh, I had the privilege of going to Queen's University for my Bachelor of Education, and I had a whole bunch of Trent students in my cohort. And I became really popular among the Trent students because I knew Professor David Poole. And uh, one of them, um, my best friend at Queen's that year was a gentleman named Jeff Mahood. Uh, I wrote to him a few days ago, and he wrote this back to me. He said, David, uh, Richard, I'd love it if you could let David know that I think of him often and remember my experiences in Trent Math fondly, and my experience helping with his Math 280 class was foundational in the way that I approach teaching math with my students. He's been teaching for over 20 years, the last 15 at an all-girls high school in Toronto called Bishop Strawn, and think about the impact this one teacher has had on several thousand students over his teaching career. Think of the impact David has had in his 32 years at Trent. Multiply that by several thousand, and you can see the type of impact that this one educator has made in the lives of so many people, young people, today. Uh, another small world Trent connection, many of you will know the name Sarah Pauly. She's a well-known Canadian filmmaker. She recently won the Oscar for directing and writing the screenplay for a movie called Woman Talking. Well, it turns out in the case of It's a Small World, Sarah is married to my best friend from grade one, who was the best man at my wedding, along with my dear friend Carolyn Mack, who's, who's here in the audience. We're actually going to see each other tomorrow, Sarah, her husband, Carolyn, and our grade one teacher, as we take our grade one teacher out to dinner in Toronto. Sarah, some of you will know this, was the recipient of the honorary doctorate at Trent back in 2009. She and her husband just loved their visit to Trent. They got to meet the university president. They had dinner with Roberta Bondar, the legendary astronaut who at the time was the chancellor of Trent, and they will be thrilled that I came to Trent and connected with all of you today. Uh, David, my connection to you, you were so nice to me. Let me, let me uh, return the favor. I taught linear algebra at Quest uh, six times. All six times I used the best linear algebra textbook I have ever read, which of course was written by you. And after I gave that Canadian Math Society talk, I had uh, a really special picture, which was uh, a picture with past uh, recipients of this particular uh, teaching award from the Mass Society, and David, that was the last time we connected, and it was so nice to see you, or, or one of the last times. And now I teach at the Vancouver campus of Northeastern, yeah, yes, it is a bit of an oxymoron, but over the last three years, I've been able to work with students from different cultures, different continents, different communities, none of whom had their undergraduate degree in math or computer science. And uh, the program is called Align, and the, the goal of this program is to specifically welcome and recruit students from underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, we have 54% women uh, identifying as women, both at our Vancouver campus as well as our, at our main Boston campus. And I love the tagline or the, the mission statement of the Northeastern Computer Science faculty, which is we believe Every single person can do computer science. Computer science is for everyone. And because I went to Waterloo where computer science was a part of math, was actually a program within the math department, I'm just gonna change the tagline and say mathematics is for all. Every single student here, every single individual in this room, every single student in the world can succeed in math provided they're given the right opportunity. In other words, there's no such thing as a handful of people are gifted in the subject and math is reserved just for those elite X percent. This is the exact opposite <laughs> message portrayed in this movie called Gifted uh, from 2017. And I'll just play a short clip from that movie here.
Mary, you knew the problem was incorrect. Why didn't you say anything? Hank says I'm not supposed to correct older people. Nobody likes a smart ass. <laughs> Nobody likes a smart ass. Great. Usually, when I leave a movie theater, I feel encouraged, I feel inspired, I feel challenged. Uh, I saw a movie on Netflix two days ago called Nyad, N-Y-A-D, uh, a story of uh, someone who dreamed of completing the first ever unassisted swim from Cuba to Florida. She tried at the age of 28, couldn't do it. Tried three more times, and then finally, on her fifth try at the age of 64, she succeeded in completing the first ever unassisted swim from Cuba to Florida. That, that was the last movie I saw, feeling so inspired watching a movie. I left that movie feeling a, an emotion I'd never ever felt before, leaving a movie theater. I felt angry. I was furious watching this movie, uh, and, and I got home that night and I began to write. And then the next day I wrote some more, and a few days later, this op-ed appeared in the Toronto Star newspaper. And because this, what I'm going to share here, or what I shared in this op-ed, provides the foundation for the rest of my talk, I just wanted you to read, or I, sorry, I'm sorry, I wanted to read this 600-word op-ed to all of you right now. I hope you enjoy this. Mary Adler is a seven-year-old whiz kid, able to multiply large numbers in her head and instantly calculate square roots. She devours textbooks on differential equations and solves calculus problems that stump MIT math professors. How does she do this? Is it because Mary is the one in a billion prodigy destined for greatness, inheriting her genes from her mother and grandmother who themselves were genius mathematicians? That is what Gifted would have you believe, the Hollywood movie that perpetuates the stereotype that math, that only certain people can excel in mathematics. The storyline implies that giftedness is a result of nature rather than nurture, of winning a genetic lottery rather than devoting thousands of hours to deliberate practice. But Hollywood got it wrong. As the former coach of Canada's team to the International Math Olympiad, I've worked with exceptional students who can solve the same problems as the fictional Mary Adler. Not a single one of these math Olympians, myself included, was a child prodigy. Instead of inheriting a gift, we developed our grit. We did this thanks to innovative teachers who stretched us far beyond the low bar set by an uninspired curriculum. We wrestled with open-ended questions that forced us to synthesize our knowledge across many areas of mathematics. We spent time thinking deeply as we recreated key mathematical insights for ourselves rather than simply memorizing and regurgitating formulas to pass an exam. Decades later, we are contributing to Canada in diverse sectors through our professional work in education, law, healthcare, and, uh, and technology. We succeeded because we received authentic mathematical experiences that developed our problem-solving skills. In that way, we were truly gifted. We gift young children with opportunities to engage deeply in other subjects by having them paint their own art, compose their own songs, and write their own stories, even though few will reach the heights of Margaret Atwood, David Foster, uh, sorry, Emily Carr, David Foster, or Margaret Atwood. We do this because we recognize that all students, regardless of ability or level, can grow through education rather than act as if art, music, and creative writing are only accessible to natural-born geniuses. So why do we view mathematics differently? Maybe it's because we don't believe children are capable of problem solving. And so it's just easier to have our students reproduce the rules and formulas of European white men from 2000 years ago. As a result, far too many of our students do what no mathematician would call mathematics. Subtracting logarithms, graphing trigonometric functions, solving equations using the quadratic formula. It's a watered down version of the real thing, the equivalent of learning mathematics or learning and teaching art using paint by numbers. In an essay famous among, among math educators, high school teacher Paul Lockhart laments how our North American math curriculum is stripped of authentic experiences that derive, deprive students of such a natural, satisfying means of human communication. After all, if music is more than jiggling symbols around according to a fixed set of rules, then surely so is mathematics, humanity's other universal language. So what then are authentic mathematical experiences? Here's just a small sample, four that I know. An elementary student learned ratios by making pancakes for seven people using a recipe for four. 
a middle school student figured out how the interest rates work to help her family make better financial decisions. A team of high school students, uh, this is a high school in Markham, uh, learned the relationship between a cylinder's volume and surface area and wrote to the president of Campbell Soup to explain how their company could cut manufacturing costs by making their can's diameter equal to its height. A university student that I taught with the most severe math anxiety I have ever seen designed and implemented a roommate matching algorithm for all first year incoming undergraduates. These young people engaged in the problem solving process, getting stuck, finding and resolving cognitive obstacles, developing conceptual understanding and communicating solutions supported by quantitative evidence. Through these experiences, I'm sorry, hang on. Through these experiences, these students developed their confidence, creativity, and critical thinking skills, preparing them well in this post-truth age of alternative facts and fake news. Let's empower all of our students this way. Hollywood teaches us that those who excel in math are natural geniuses, or that individuals who engage deeply with the subject are socially awkward or mentally unstable. Let's write a different story together, a story that's more hopeful and true, and then all of our students will be gifted. Thanks. Thank you. It, was, it, it felt really good to write that. Uh, and I just wrote, you know, a lot of you are writers. You, you know that sometimes writing feels, feels so good. Uh, and I was no longer angry. I still don't like that movie, but I uh, was no longer angry. I've got four key points today that I wanted to share with you. And the first key point that I want to make is that every single student Every single student can succeed in mathematics if they're given an authentic mathematical experience. I've had the privilege of visiting elementary schools and high schools all over the country. I currently work with graduate students, some of whom are older than me. I'm thinking of one student that I know who's in her late 40s. After many, many years of raising children at home, supporting her family, she turned to her partner, looked at him in the eye and said, my turn, my turn. Uh, and then she's now enrolled in a Master's of Computer Science after not having taken a math class in over 25 years. She's absolutely flourishing in this program because she knows that mathematics is for everyone because she's receiving an authentic experience where she's able to align her experience, knowledge, and passion and combine that with math and computer science. I've got three fun problems for you today. And so let's look at them together. These, I hope, represent authentic mathematical experiences. So David, I have a big favor to ask. I'm just going to ask you to come up here. Uh, you and I are just going to play a game where we alternate turns. And so I, I don't have a chalkboard here, so we're just going to shout, shout the numbers out. And you'll just need to speak loudly into that, into that microphone. Uh, so the number 17 is written on the board. And David and I, we're both very, very competitive people who uh, fight, fight often. <laughs> He's the nicest person in the world. Uh, that um, what we're going to do is subtract either one or two, and then the first person who says zero wins the game. So David and I are just going to illustrate how this works, and then we're going to ask you to play this game with the person sitting next to you, and then we'll see if one of you, hopefully especially uh, either a Trent student or someone who's not yet a Trent student but might be in the future, can beat me uh, in this game. So David, do you want to go first or second? We're starting with 17. I'll go first. Great. Please go ahead. Uh, I'll subtract two to go down to 15. 15. Great. And I'll, I have no idea what to do, so I'll just subtract. I'll, I'll just say uh, 14. Uh, 12. Great. Uh, 11. Nine. Great. And so what I'm doing is I'm either subtracting one or subtracting two. David's doing the same. Sorry, you said nine, so nine. I'll say seven. Six. Uh, I'll say four. Three. <laughs> uh, and, and so now I know I've lost, and, uh, and um, uh, all right, uh, I'll say one. Zero. Zero, and then so David wins the game. Thank you, David. Okay, yeah. So, so now, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, with the person sitting next to you, can I please ask you to play this game twice? Could I please ask you to play this game twice, once where you go first and once you go second? And then just as you, as you analyze this game, as you play this game, can you figure out the optimal winning strategy for this game? Do you want to go first or do you want to go second? And what if we change 17 to a larger number, like 30 or 40? Does this change the game? And then what I'm going to do is, just in a few minutes, I'm going to ask one of you to see if you want to play this game against me. Please go ahead, just take a few minutes, discuss that right now. Thanks. All right, folks, 
Folks, let me get your attention, please. This is great. Awesome. What's, what's your name? I'm Karis. Karis, nice to meet you. And Karis, what's your connection to Trent? Nice. So what, what year are you in, Karis? Awesome. So I'm going to get destroyed by you, uh, but, but that's, that's okay. That's okay. And then just as Karis is kicking my, uh, sorry, is, uh, is um, beating me, uh, what I'm going to do is ask you, what are some interesting questions that you can ask that will make this game really interesting for an eight-year-old, for a 20-year-old, for uh, a math teacher, etc.? Okay, uh, so Karis, uh, would you like to go first or would you like to go second? First. Okay, no. uh, okay, go for it. 15. Okay, 15. So I want you to listen really carefully to the numbers Karis is saying. Uh, 14. 12. 10. 9. 8. 5. 3. 2. <laughs> Great, thank you Karis. Great. And Karis, what was, what was your strategy? So just, just you know, feel free to, uh, from where, where you are there, yeah. Multiples of, three. Multiples of three. Awesome, right? And how many of you figured out there was some key insight? Several of you in the back said, okay, uh, three is a big number. If I can get to three, I win the game. And what Karis realizes is it's not just three that matters, six matters. If you can get to six, you win. If you can get to nine, you win, et cetera. So look at what Karis did. I think I said player two, the numbers on the right. I guarantee Karis said all the numbers on the left. Notice that every number Kara said was a multiple of three. And then I have a sad face down here because uh, I, I lost. So this was really, really exciting. I taught a six-year-old how to play this game. A six-year-old doesn't understand, or at least this six-year-old didn't really understand multiples of three. So I asked this student, I asked this young person, uh, if, if I take two, what do you do? And he said, I'll take one. If I take one, what do you do? He said, I'll take two. And so I taught the six-year-old how to play this game using that optimal strategy that I can describe in two lines. And it was hilarious watching him hustle his mom. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, educate his mother on the beautiful properties of combinatorial game theory. And, and um, it was just wonderful to watch. It was wonderful to watch. And then afterwards, the mom's like, okay, let me go first this time. She makes one small mistake because I think she thought it was like even numbers rather than multiples of three. And then the six-year-old <laughs> beat her again. Uh, and it was really, really funny. And so one question, one question, sorry, I, I missed your name. It's Owen, so Owen, you, you solved this problem pretty quickly, and one neat, neat question that I want to pose for you and, and Karis and others is, what if we change 17 to a larger number, and there was something about multiples of three, right? Something about multiples of three, and you can show that if the starting number is a multiple of three, you want to go second. If the starting number is not a multiple of three, as David and Karis said, you want to go first and then make your number a multiple of three, subtract one or subtract two, and do that. What you did as you did this problem was engage in the four steps of computational thinking. Think of creating a banana split dessert. Uh, what all of the computational thinking that's required to do that. You have to decompose a problem into smaller parts. You can recognize patterns. You can abstract the problem. In other words, extract the most important salient features of that problem, and then finally, design an algorithm to get the result that you want. So there, once again, decomposition is breaking a problem into small parts. Ah, multiples of three. If I can get to three, I win. How do I get to three? Oh, if I can get to six, I'm gonna win. Ah, recognizing patterns, three, six, nine, 12, 15. Karis instantly said this is a multiple of three. Abstraction, we can extract the most important information. For those of you that have taken a course in number theory at Trent, you might just think of this as two states, zero mod three, not zero mod three. And so those are the, the two winning and losing states of the problem that tells you everything you need to know about solving this game. And then ultimately, you then, as Karis did, as David did, you created an algorithm to beat me. Three challenge problems for you. If you are connected with the Trent community in any way, or you're not uh, yet, um, I wanted to just uh, leave, I've already left my email address in that handout, and I just wanted to encourage all of you, any of you, if you're interested in working on one or more of these problems, you're welcome to email me your solution, and I would be delighted to give you feedback on what you write. So here's the first question. Instead of subtracting one and two, what if you can subtract one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight? 
you can subtract any number from one to m. How does that change the optimal strategy? Can you find a general formula for when the second player is guaranteed to win? What if I'm a jerk and say whoever writes down zero loses the game instead of wins the game? How does that change the strategy? Have any of you um, uh, taken courses in computer science here at Trent? Just any of you? Great, okay, a couple of you, great. So if you've learned how to code in a programming language of your choice, here's a question that I wanna give you. Can you write a program that takes two inputs, one, the subtraction set, in other words, all the numbers that can be subtracted, so in the game that we just did, it was one and two, and then n is the starting number, in the game we did, it was 17, and then the output of your computer program will be all the winning moves. So. In the game that we did, if I give you these two input sets, one and two, those are the numbers that could be subtracted, and 17, the starting number, then the correct output is 15, 12, 9, 6, 3, 0. So all you have to do, remember these were the numbers that Karis said? That is your optimal strategy. Can you teach a computer, which only understands two things, zeros and ones, can you get a computer to instantly output all the winning moves? So I'll leave that as a challenge problem for you. And especially if I give you, for example, Owen uh, and Stefan, you, you, had, uh, you got the, the problem I gave you really quickly. What if I give you... Oh, great. So, so let me... <laughs> gotcha. But let me, uh, let, me, let, me, let me do a variation. How about if the subtraction set is 136 and then is 100? So this is a much more interesting problem, and I'll let you think about what that is. Where I live in British Columbia, I really like how the entire curriculum for every single subject is not based around content knowledge, it's based around what we call core competencies. Uh, I, I think this is a really good thing, and um, what the very contentious argument that I'm going to make is that these competencies, especially communication and thinking, are best learned through a mathematics education. Obviously, every single subject uh, that, that, is, uh, that a student learns develops these competencies, but math, and for those of us that study math and have spent, like Kathy and David, have spent a lifetime of doing math and teaching math, we know just how much students develop these key life skills through really engaging math problems. What is communicating and collaborating? Well, I hope you feel like you experienced looking at this, connecting and engaging with others. You just did that in this activity that we did. Creative thinking, critical, reflective thinking. I hope that you felt, and I would add computational thinking to this, adding some, oh, zero, three, six, nine. Look at this, analyzing, critiquing, questioning, investigating, designing, developing, reflecting, assessing. Most math classes I've discovered, students don't get to do this. Students are actively taking notes to try to memorize a formula in order to get a good mark on an exam, whereas the best types of math problems, the most engaging problems, are ones where students, where time just blows by fast because students are so engaged in this. So in addition to these thinking skills, I want to add computational thinking, the decomposition, abstraction, pattern recognition, algorithm design that we just talked about. And the point that, the second key point that I want to make tonight is that doing mathematics, for example, engaging in a fun problem like we just did, is one of the best ways a student, whether they're 12 or whether they're 52, can develop their communication skills and their thinking skills. Let me give you an example that's the opposite of this. So I flew in from Vancouver earlier today. I took the 11 p.m. flight Vancouver time, so 2 a.m. Toronto, uh, Peterborough time. And then uh, the flight, no drama, I arrived at the airport around 6.30 local time. But then there were two Air Canada attendants that were chatting as we deplaned. De they weren't looking at any of the passengers, they were just totally engrossed in their own conversation, not realizing that all 300 of us on that plane were opened, uh, went through a door that wasn't supposed to be open. And so we, we uh, were mixed with the passengers who had finished the US screening, and we were actually in the US zone of Pearson Airport. And then once they realized this mistake, they immediately locked the door, and um, we were waiting there for nearly two hours. 
Uh, and so this happened uh, this morning. And there was no communication whatsoever. Uh, they just all wanted to do was find whoever committed the breach or uh, the security violation. Uh, there was absolutely no thinking that was done because they were just scrambling. And then ultimately someone from US Customs and Border Protection came and said, okay, everyone who was on that Vancouver flight, uh, you just come back through the gate, just show us your ID and your boarding pass. And so eventually the problem was solved. So that took almost two hours and I said, wow, this is ridiculous. And then someone actually said, this happened yesterday. <laughs> Uh, with, with, oh, you know, this happened yesterday. Uh, oh, d did you know about this? You know, it was on the news, yeah. So this happened yesterday, but it was actually a different airline. So I guess Air Canada said, well, it's, it's not our fault because it was a different airline <laughs> yesterday. So this, no joke, happened, happened today. Uh, so this, to me, is really silly, but that's an example of how when we can't communicate and we struggle with thinking, how much our society suffers. And it's not just letting people through a wrong door. We can think of many examples where catastrophic consequences have happened because people, key people, didn't communicate and didn't engage in the type of active, critical, problem-solving thinking that is uh, required for complex challenges of the 21st century. What I'd like to do is segue into um, a very, f uh, th these next two problems will be done very quickly. Uh, I just thought, Something silly that, of course, has nothing to do with math or anything. I just wanted to give you a little silly puzzle here. I'd like you to color each of those seven points, red, blue, or green. If you're colorblind, just use uh, the numbers one, two, and three. The only rule, the only rule is that you're not allowed to color two points the same color if they're connected by a line. So, for example, if A is red, B, which is connected to A, can't be red. So for example, if A is red, B could be blue, B could be green, uh, um, uh, and your goal is to try to make sure that each of those seven points is given one of those colors, red, blue, and green, and what I'll do is, can you just look at me if you've solved this? I know some of you were looking at this, and I promise if you had just a few more minutes, you would have been able to get this. Um, folks, take a look here on the board. This is the solution that Anna uh, came up with. Uh, Anna, you had uh, your, I think if I remember, Anna, your reds were A and G, your blues were B, C, and F, and then your greens were D and E. Will, you had the exact same solution as Anna, except your uh, blue and green were flipped. But either way, your B, C, and F were the same color, your D and E were the same color. I'm just wondering, did any of you get a solution? If you got a solution, did any of you get a solution where a and G were not together, where B, C, and F were not together, where D and E were not together. Did everybody get something like that? Maybe your red and green switched. Is that what you got? Interesting, interesting. So maybe, just maybe, this always has to be the case. In any valid solution, uh, uh, this is called a feasible coloring, in any valid solution, must we have Anna's solution, will solution, where A and G are the same, B, C, and F are the same, and D and E are the same. I mean, after all, math is like a democracy. If 20 people all got the same solution, then surely it has to be, <laughs> has to be that, right? No, maybe not. Okay. So uh, the first way that we can make an argument, and so once again, connecting it to communicating and critical thinking, uh, these core competencies. I really like this problem because I think it does a really good job of both. I work primarily with students for whom English is not their first language, and so they're trying to convince and write in their second language, and in some cases their third language, of trying to make a convincing argument that their solution is completely rigorous as well as um, uh, uh, correct. And so, uh, and, and concise as well. So here's, here's one way that we can do this. If we start with the triangle ABE, well, we only have three colors and we have a triangle, those three colors, I'm sorry, those three points have to be given three different colors. So what we can do is just arbitrarily call them red, blue, and green in whatever order we want. Can you look at point C, everyone? If we start with this assumption, what must C be? What must C be? Shout it out. Blue, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Heather. C has to be blue because it's connected to a red and a green. It has to be blue. So I really like this because I feel like this is accessible to someone who's not an undergraduate math student, right? 
And, and it's, it's so, so nice. So you can just go through this and then one by one, for example, you can show the D has to be green. How about F? What, what's F have to be? Blue, right? Because F is connected to two greens as well as a red. Look at point A. So F has to be blue. And then finally, G has to be red. So we've made an argument. We've communicated. And we've created a formal uh, a piece of formal logic to show that this is the only possible solution. Why this is really interesting, for those of you, I was fascinated with maps as a child. Uh, so this is, for example, the country of India, where every, uh, um, in India they have, sorry, just one second, states or union territories, unlike us in Canada, where we have provinces and territories. So for example, on a map of Canada, Ontario and Quebec have different colors. Let's say that we have a rule where in, in India, you're not allowed to color a state same color as a neighboring state. What's not obvious, but if you look carefully, you might see it, the map on the left is identical to the graph on the right. And so what we can do is go through the exact same game you just did, color the points of the graph on the right, and that tells you instantly the answer to the map on the left. And it turns out that there's this beautiful math theorem that shows that any map in the world, do any of you know this? The maximum, I'm sorry, the worst number of colors you need, how many is that? It's a little bit less than six, four. Shockingly, any map in the world, yeah, any map in the world can be colored using four colors, no matter how complicated the map is. You'll see that India here is four. Canada, uh, you only need three colors, uh, but um, uh, in America, you need four. In India here, you need four. Here, let me give you another example. Do any of you like Sudoku puzzles? What's not obvious is that a Sudoku puzzle is mathematically equivalent to the game that you just did, coloring points. If you think of each cell, I've demonstrated this for two by two just because it's smaller and easier to visualize. Do you see that a two by two Sudoku can be represented, those 16 points, those 16 cells can be represented as points, and all you need to do is color each of those 16 points so that you avoid that same color having the same edge. And then if you do that, then you get the solution. And then here's another example. This looks horrible. And I'll share uh, my uh, um, personal experience with this later on. But school timetabling turns out to be equivalent mathematically to coloring a graph with points, where courses are your points. And the point that I want to make, the third uh, key point I wanted to make tonight, is that the most engaging mathematical problems are low floor, high ceiling. Uh, both Dave and I have a friend named Peter Lillydahl, a prophet, Sam Simon Fraser University in BC, who uses this uh, analogy of low floor, high ceiling, complex, not complicated. In other words, you understood what's really neat is that that graph coloring problem could be solved even by a, like a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. I'm sorry, sorry, uh, by, by, <laughs> by a Toronto, sorry. Uh, uh, no, no, I'm just, uh, I'm from Toronto and, and I've been in deep pain ever since I was minus 11 years old. Um, Cause, um, but I'm convinced this is the year we're gonna win the Stanley Cup. Uh, but we've been saying that for like 50 years. Um, so, but I feel like the most engaging problems are the ones that anyone, right, anyone can understand and get into. And what's really exciting is, uh, thank you, Liam, for coming, uh, 12 years old, and I love that you're engaging with these problems uh, and, and you're understanding these problems and having fun doing this with your mom, a, a Trent grad who was taught by David. Uh, so once again, for those of you in the audience, uh, if any of you are interested, you're welcome to email me. Is there, if you are given any graph G, is there an algorithm that you can follow that gives you a way to color the points ideally using as few points as possible? So for example, take a look at the graph that I gave you. Is there an algorithm that you can follow? Here's one algorithm. Just label the points A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Oh, I guess I've already done that. And then starting with point A, give it the color uh, that's available. Get, and then, like for example, call the colors one, two, three instead of red, blue, green. Give it the smallest number color that's available and then move on to the next vertex. And so that will give you an algorithm to solve this problem. And then so the question that I have is, does your algorithm always always guarantee that you use the fewest number of colors. It turns out that if your answer is yes, you win a million dollar prize for solving the most important unsolved problem. It's called the P versus MP problem. Uh, and so probably your algorithm is not 
optimal, or you'll find one or two really weird cases where your really good algorithm gives you a terrible result, where maybe your graph only requires two or three colors, but your algorithm requires seven. I can give you an example of a graph where uh, the actual graph only requires two colors, but my smart, uh, reasonable, rational algorithm requires 10,000 colors. So I'll just let you think about how interesting this, this gets. Uh, and then the last problem that I have for you is uh, a problem that many, many university administrators face. In fact, we have several in the audience now. And so I just picked these seven random committees. I went on the Trent website uh, earlier today. I read years ago a book by Peter Gazowski uh, from the uh, very well-known CBC journalist. I didn't realize uh, uh, Peter's connection to, to Trent until uh, an hour ago. So I've got these seven random committees and I've got a whole bunch of people who happen to be in the audience who are a part of these committees. And what I want to do is schedule these committees so that everyone who needs to be there is there. And so just as an example, I've given you a schedule requiring five different time slots. So for example, between one o'clock and two o'clock, Jesse, Ray, and Vicky are meeting to discuss academic planning. And what you're going to notice is that there are, in my solution, in my non-optimal solution, there are two examples, for example, Vicky and Joanne, Julia and Aras meeting in slot two. Do you notice that those two committees, Board of Governors and Gazaski College, can meet in the same time slot because there's no conflict between the individuals in those groups? Does that make sense? Right? It's okay for Vicky and Joanne to be in one room at the same time as Julia and Aras who are in another room because you don't have a single person who belongs to both committees. You'll see that in slot three, I've cleverly been able to put Jess and Jesse together in one room with Julia, Abby, and Ray in another room at the same time slot, and I've reduced the number of time slots by one. In fact, looking at this, I've just realized that my solution of five time slots is not optimal. I could have done four time slots. Do you see how I could have done four time slots? What, what's that? I could have done three. Oh, uh, I, I, I can do four with this, Karis, because I can put um, diversity and equity and external relations at the same time slot. Do you have a solution with three? Yes. No way. Uh, you have a solution with three. Can you, can you, yeah, go for it. A and G meet at the same time, so that's slot one. Slot two is board of governors, Okay, yeah, and because I'm too lazy to say it, I'll just say B, C, and F meet at the same time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And then what's the last one, please? Damn, nice. So you were able to do it in three time slots. Did anyone else get three time slots? Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much. Did you get the same solution as? Yeah, lovely. So can I just double check? Uh, so maybe your slots were different, like your one, two, and three might have been different from Karis's one, two, three, but the same, the same idea. Did you have A and G in the same time slot? Can you just double check that, please? B, C, and F in the same time slot, D and E in the same time slot. Cool. Does this remind you of something? Does this remind you of something that maybe we've solved before, like 10 minutes ago? Yeah, all right. So. <laughs> And uh, the kind of the punchline that I want to make is that often I can solve really, really, really hard scheduling problems by converting them into graphs, drawing lines, they're called edges, joining whenever you have two committees that share a common person, and then just coloring a graph. And this is something that a 10-year-old would understand, but is very, very, very hard to apply in practice. And so this is what we intuitively, uh, sorry, unknowingly, we did. Uh, by the way, I wonder if it's a coincidence that the committees were called A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Maybe that was a coincidence. And so once again, for example, you'll notice that Vicky belongs to committees A and B, so therefore there's a line joining A and B. So that edge represents a conflict. You'll notice that Jesse belongs to three different committees, A, C, and D. So you'll notice that there's a triangle, A, C, and D, that all three of those lines are connected because Jesse can't be in two different places at the same time. And so, for example, let's say we replace Trent committees with high school courses. Let's say we replace Trent st um, staff with tr uh, high school students. Do you see how if a university, I'm sorry, let's say a high school principal was in charge of setting the exams for their school, do you see how you can solve that problem 
by figuring out which days should have which exams using this technique. And most university, uh, sorry, most uh, of the high school principals that I work with in British Columbia, they do this by hand. It's a very, very, very complex and time-consuming process. Their algorithm is called WFG. We <coughs> guess, we F, uh, we <coughs> guess, and, and um, it's not a very, very effective uh, or efficient algorithm. And so can we, can we do something different than we <coughs> guess? And how do we do this? Well, we can create a conflict graph. Let me give you an example of a conference. So many of you uh, in this room will be familiar with the OAME acronym, Ontario Association of Math Educators. The equivalent in uh, British Columbia is called BCAMT, British Columbia Association of Math Teachers. I gave a talk at the Whistler Conference uh, a few years back, and my talk was called Optimally Scheduling Classes and Exams Using Graph Theory. I shared the exact same puzzle I shared with you, and um, here was my abstract. In this informal and interactive workshop, we'll look at a simple puzzle. In fact, it's the same one I gave you. We'll then explore the applications of this solution to optimally scheduling courses and exams. I'll end the talk by presenting a project I completed with a grade 11 student in Vancouver where we developed an optimal exam schedule for his high school. That grade 11 student, Sam, came with me and we did this talk together. And I helped him write a computer program to take 475 students in 29 courses and create a perfect exam schedule with just seven days compared to what his principal was doing by hand, which took 12, and had quite a few examples of conflicts where, for example, this one student was taking French as well as AP Calculus, and so that one student had to come back like a week later to do a second exam. And do you see how using this conflict graph, we can solve it optimally? And you never, ever have a situation where a student has to take a makeup exam because of a, a conflict. Uh, over the last five years, uh, both my undergraduate students at Quest as well as my graduate students at Northeastern and I have created the annual master timetable for a whole bunch of schools in British Columbia. What we're able to do is create schedules that satisfy every single one of the hard constraints set by the teachers and the administration. For example, the one gym can't be used by two different physical education classes at the same time. These are called hard constraints. That one part-time teacher is never available on Tuesday, and so that's a hard constraint that has to be satisfied. And we're able to get 98, 99% of the student course requests, in other words, students saying we want to take these courses to get into university, and we're able to satisfy not 80% of them or 85% percent of them close to 100 and we published three papers at international conferences one of my highlights uh, at this time I had only had one vaccine and so I would have had to quarantine for two weeks at either end so I was unable to go it was a place that I've always wanted to go Vienna uh, uh, the 2020 conference was cancelled for obvious reasons the 2021 conference my wife's favorite movie of all time is sound of music uh, I've, I've never ever been to Austria, but would love to change that in the future, but I logged in at three in the morning Vancouver time, gone in on Zoom to watch my former student Irene speak to an international conference of the world's experts in scheduling optimization. She was the only person in the entire conference without a PhD. And um, it was so awesome to hear her uh, present uh, at this international conference and feeling the sense of, wow, I can make a valuable contribution, and I love that several hundred people and several dozen teachers are using the schedule that I created. And I've been able to do this with a whole bunch of students. And so the last key point that I wanna share with you tonight is that I believe, and David knows this from 32 years at Trent, that a student's mathematical career is transformed when they are given the chance to do something interesting with their math education, when they're given a chance, for example, to solve a real world problem. And what I wanted to do, for those of you in the audience today, especially if you're connected, uh, if you're a student at Trent, uh, I've left my email address there. I want to just challenge and encourage you, is there a real life problem you can solve for someone? Maybe it's in here in the Peterborough community. Maybe it's a problem for your department head. Maybe it's a, a problem for, uh, for example, even a problem scheduling uh, meals uh, with uh, cooking chores with your roommates. This is, this is something I did during my undergrad. And wouldn't it be neat if you could use your Trent education to solve a real world problem and implement that solution and be the change you wish to see in the world? with mathematics. And so just as we recap our time today, 
We talked about these four big pillars of computational thinking. These are core skills for 21st century living. Decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction, algorithm design. You do this, by the way, 100 times a day. Every time you brush your teeth, every time you shampoo your hair, you're following an algorithm, right? You're following an algorithm. And what I believe a mathematics education does is it develops these four skills in a way that no other subject can and prepare students so well to make an impact on the issues and the causes that matter to them. And the four key points, let me just recap them. I believe that every single student can succeed in math if they're given an authentic mathematical experience, and I hope I was able to share three such problems with you today. I believe that doing mathematics is one of the best ways a student can develop their communication and thinking skills. I believe that the most engaging math problems are low floor, high ceiling. They're complex, but they're not complicated. And a student's math career is transformed when they're given a chance to solve a real world problem. I love this uh, mission statement. I've had this for the last uh, 10 years of my life. Just one sentence. I want to help students discover their potential and purpose by transforming how they experience math. Every time I walk into a classroom, I'm currently teaching four classes this semester to 121 students. Every time I walk into one of my classes, this is what I'm thinking. How can I transform their experience and help them discover their potential and purpose? And then how I do this is by providing these authentic mathematical experiences. As I'm thinking about having dinner with my grade one teacher tomorrow, someone I've only seen twice in the last 35 years, I'm reminded of this quote, uh, that true teachers use themselves as bridges over which they invite their students to cross, then having facilitated their crossing, joyfully collapse, encouraging them to create bridges of their own. I'm so grateful that my grade one teacher was a bridge to me. I'm so grateful that I had many, many educators over my life who've been mentors to me, including David Poole, who were bridges to me. And I'm so honored that I got to speak here today to be able to celebrate the life and the legacy of David over his 32-year career as he was a bridge to thousands and thousands of alumni, and now they are being bridges to all of their students. Folks, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.